I want to continue today the series that we've been in for the last couple months called Do You Know Who You Are? And I want to speak today to you on a, for a few moments on the idea of I am adopted. Little Daniel was jammed into a small orphanage room filled with cribs and fatherless children. He seldom was able to go outside and play. He called the only man working at the orphanage a, secure, a security guard father. Daniel was one of six million orphans in the nation that had been decimated with fatherlessness. His story is far too common in a country ravaged by famine and poverty. His mother, who was a poor peasant gal, had most likely been raped by her boyfriend's brother, and she gave birth to Daniel in a culture that saw him worthless because he had no father and he could not inherit land. The myth in this country is that little boys and little girls like Daniel will grow up to be murderers and criminals, and they're often left abandoned to let die. It's a miracle of God's grace that Daniel even ended up in an orphanage with the pressure put on his mother from her family and without the ability to provide for him, she simply wanted to abandon him in the forest and let nature take its course, which was a common occurrence in this culture. But again, by God's grace, the tribal elders and her village stopped her from doing this because of the fear that the government would find out and they would experience negative repercussions. In order to remove the shame from the family, Daniel was placed in an orphanage. In his book, Who Do You Think You Are?, Mark Driscoll tells how a friend of the church he used to pastor in Washington one day visited Daniel's village, and he and his wife finalized Daniel's adoption, and they brought him home to meet his two new sisters. His friends related the story that the poverty he saw was one of the most difficult and devastating situations he had ever witnessed. He writes, I had never seen aggressive begging before my ch at, by children my children's age. This really disturbed me and affected me. Matthew chapter 25, 40 came alive to me. I tell you the truth, the way you treat the least of these is how you treat me. Next to my salvation experience in Africa in 2005, which also opened my heart to Africa, this adoption process has been the most impactful event in my life. I had not known the horrible plight of so many of the country's orphans. The orphans that are on the street are par partially a result of parents who died from HIV, but the rest are from families that send these kids out into the streets to literally die. Most either end up dead or they turn to child prostitution. This man and his wife shared that their adopting Daniel helped them both to understand the depth of the gospel in a way that they had never, ever experienced before. Daniel was doomed, and it had nothing to, of his doing, he said. He could not save himself. Someone needed to save him. The picture of adoption is the story of what Jesus Christ has done for every one of us in this room this morning. We are all sinners. But by God's grace, we have a Savior and we have a salvation, salvation through Jesus Christ. Nothing we have ever done could earn this privilege. It is pure, unadulterated grace. There are over six million orphans in that nation, and Daniel is only one of the few that will make it out. He will live a life of blessing that he didn't do anything to earn and he did not pay for. Again, it's grace. He will have a church family that loves him. He will learn about Jesus in a way that would not be possible otherwise. Just as Daniel is adopted by his new earthly father, we've also been adopted by our spiritual father in Jesus Christ. Would you follow along as I read Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 to 22? It's a very powerful passage. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, 
because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love following the example of Christ. He loved us and he offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, coarse jokes. These are not for you. Instead, let there be a thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. So don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins. For the anger of God will fall on all who disobey him. Don't participate in these things that people do. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. It is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret. But their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them, for the light makes everything visible. That's why it is said, Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead. He's quoting the Old Testament prophet. And Christ will give you light. So, based on this, be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but live like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves. Make music to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks for everything to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to share with you, just for the next few moments, how can we live out the six truths of what does it mean to be an, an adopted daughter and an adopted son of God? If you're a guest with us today, we're really glad that you're here. If you'll look in your bulletin, you will find notes. I encourage you to take notes. Those of you that are in a small group, and if you aren't in a small group and you'd like to be if you fill out the friends card, we're just finding that in small groups, big things happen. We see how people's growth just, it's almost like it's turbocharged when you can hear the message on Sunday and then come and be with your small group family and be able to dialogue and discuss it and how do we put it into practice. Here's the first truth. Would you write in your notes there, I am adopted by God, the creator. Now, according to W.A. Strange and his book, Children in the Early Church, Daniel's story was common to many children, actually, in New Testament times. In the Roman Empire, children were often beaten and left as dead in the garbage or the dung heap, or they were taken to die, or they were taken by unscrupulous people to be used as slaves, prostitutes, gladiators, or worse. In fact, infant mortality was so high, it is reported that only half the children born lived to their fifth birthdays, and fewer than 40% lived until their 20th birthday. With this being true, a family would need to give birth to at least five children to have just two live to adulthood. And many families waited for eight to nine days to see if their children lived before they'd even give them a name. Infanticide was common, especially with disabled children. Methods included abandonment in the desert, tying babies to a rock and throwing them in the river, and even suffocation. Within this culture of infanticide and abandonment, Adoption usually happened by those in the wealthier upper class, but their motivations were most self-serving and were not noble. 
T. Billings writes, in this ancient Roman context, adoption was generally not about babies, nor was it about childless couples finding a way to have children. Instead, the adoptees were usually adults. And adoption was first a legal arrangement to provide an heir who would receive an inheritance and enter into a new household with all its privileges and responsibilities. Now, to make it very clear, political leaders who desired to protect their massive empires occasionally chose an adult heir to adopt to extend the greatness of their legacy beyond their lifetime. Jean Mosner writes this. In fact, all of the uh, Julia Claudian emperors adopted sons. Although Claudius had a biological son by Julia Agrippina, he adopted Nero. You've all heard of Nero? At age 12, and he made him heir to the dynasty. If you know anything about history, Nero was hideous in his actions towards Christians. He fed them to the lions. He murdered them. One of his favorite things to do was to have gladi gladiators fight at night, and he would impale Christians on uh, stakes and then light them on fire so that people could see what was going on in the arena. Christians bucked this cultural wickedness, and many of them who were poor themselves began adopting throwaway children as family. Now, why would they do this? The answer lies in Paul's comparison of the gospel to adoption. Church in Ephesians 2, 2 and Romans 8, 17, we, it says, we were once children of disobedience, but now we're heirs with Christ as the Father's children. Again, Mark Driscoll writes, Paul connected adoption as a major theme of the Bible to the center of all scripture. And have you thought of this before? Jesus, who was himself adopted by his early father, Joseph, and his work on the cross for us. Church, adoption is a vital principle that is taught all the way through the scripture. In the Old Testament, in Exodus chapter 4, 22, God told Moses, you go tell Pharaoh that he is to let my son Israel Go so he can go and worship me. The truth is, truth is whom God calls his children and adopted into his family. Abraham was a Gentile before God had adopted him. Because of Adam and Eve's betrayal against their father, they chose Satan over their creator. Every person who accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, Father God, your creator adopts you. Adoption is at the core of the good news of Christianity. The truth is, loved ones, Satan had discarded every one of us here. But the Father, who loves us unconditionally, sent his Son so that we could be adopted into his family. You are wanted. You are desired. You are chosen. And you are called by your creator, Father God. Most of you know this scripture. But John 3.16 says it best. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Why? Because he loves you and he wanted to adopt you. Everyone who believes him will not perish but have eternal life. So the first truth, how do we live out this whole idea of adoption is I've been adopted. You have been adopted if you've confessed Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior by your God and creator. Look at number two. I am adopted by a father. Contrary to what our culture is promoting, a father is one of the most significant influences in a person's life. So much of our life is determined by who our father is and how he behaves. Little Daniel has on his birth certificate these words, father disown. But he has a new father now who's adopted him. With all the resources and the willingness to transform his entire life and destiny. 
Little Daniel's life is vastly different than he could have been. In most English translations in the book of the Ephesians, Paul refers to God as our Father eight times. In Ephesians 5.1, in the passage that I read to you this morning, it says this, imitate God. Therefore, in everything you do, why? Because you are his dear children. Uh, yesterday was my birthday, and really it was just very low-key. I really didn't do anything on it. But Benjamin called me twice, and he had me talk with our grandson. And he just kept saying, Dad, he looks just like you. And I kept saying, I am so sorry. <laughs> no, he looks just like you. I'm so sorry. Didn't mean for that to happen. <laughs> he sure is a cute little guy, though. We are his children because he adopted us, and he is our father. John 1, 10 through 13 says this. Jesus came into this very world that he created. But notice this. But the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him. Next. He gave the right to become the children of God. That word right in the Greek means he gave them the authority. They are now reborn. They're born again, not with a physical birth resulting from a human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. Again, loved ones, he loves you and I so much that he planned for our birth before we were ever born. And because of what happened in the garden and because sin has left us all broken, we've all been left abandoned. Father God says, I will not allow that to stand because at my heart, I created the human family so that you can know that you belong to me and that you're loved and that you're cared for and that you're accepted. If you're a grandparent, you know what it's like to look at your grandchildren. Now we've got a little girl. Unbelievable. And I said to Kelsey, who does she look like? Because she surely doesn't look like anybody on the wood side. She said, well, I don't know. I said, I think she looks like you. And I said, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. <laughs> as, now listen, as important as your parents are, and the fifth commandment is we're told to honor our parents, correct? What is more important is who is your spiritual father? The Bible says because of our sin nature... We are born into sin, and Satan is our father. He's our legal, spiritual authority until you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. To break the hold that he has on each one of us, Father God has pray, paid a great price to adopt you. 1 Peter 1, 18, 20 says this. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you've inherited from your ancestors. <coughs> And the ransom he paid was not mere gold or silver. It was the precious blood of Christ. The sinless, spotless lamb of God. If you can get this this morning. If you're struggling with depression. If you're struggling with the sense that you don't feel you belong. Or that you don't matter. Or that you don't have any self-worth. You've been purchased by Christ himself. When he died on the cross and his hands were put on the cross like this, he was saying, this is how much I love you. It couldn't be any stronger. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But he's now revealed him to you in these last days. I'm adopted by God the creator. I'm adopted by God the father. Look at number three. I'm adopted because of my brother. This is a family affair. <laughs> you know that song? It's a family affair. 
Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> Ephesians 1.5 says this. God decided in advance, in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. If you are in Jesus Christ today, you need to know that you bring him great, great, great pleasure. Again, and forgive me, but now that I'm 65, I guess my mind can wander and I can talk about whatever I want. <laughs> they sent me the newest video of little Brady. And it has his back and his head turned to me. And all of a sudden, this goofy little song comes on. And he starts going. <laughs> but what really gets me when a certain tune he goes. <laughs> I've watched this thing 100 times. It's the goofiest thing in the world. But he's in my image. And Ben says, Dad, he's so much like you. Well, listen. You've been created in the image of God. You have the ability to think because you were created in his image. You have the ability to feel because you're created in his village. image. You have the ability to create and to make and to choose and to act. Because you're created in his image. And it brought him great pleasure. In a culture that promotes that there are other paths to God, other saviors and other plans to find salvation, the gospel shines through this enculturated darkness and proclaims with a power and a certainty that our spiritual adoption is solely by Jesus Christ. The plan of salvation and our adoption into the family only comes through Jesus Christ. Why? Because it's he who paid the price for our salvation. Todd Billing writes this. The God of the Bible has no not natural or begotten children apart from Jesus the Son. All the rest of us need to be adopted. Jesus knew that that is why he had to come to earth. In John 14 and 18, speaking to his disciples, he said this, I will not abandon you as orphans. He wasn't just being poetic here, church. I'm not going to abandon you as orphans. I will come back to get you. Hebrews 2, 9 to 15 says this about us clearly, that Jesus is both our brother, but he's our savior. If you've not read this before, listen to this. What we do see is Jesus, who was given a position a little lower than the angels when he became a human being. And because he suffered death for us, he is now crowned with glory and honor. Yes, by God's grace, Jesus tasted death for everyone. God, for whom and through whom everything was made, chose to bring many children into glory. And it was only right that he should make Jesus through his suffering, a perfect leader. Why? Fit to bring them into their salvation. So now we see Jesus and the one he makes holy as having the same father. This is why Jesus is not ashamed to call you and I his brothers and sisters. For he said, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you among the assembled people. He also said, I will put my trust in him. That is, I and the children God has given me. Because God's children are human beings. Loved ones, this is why the second person of the Trinity, the second person of the Godhead, who is eternal, he has always been and he will always be, he had to become a human being. Why? Because his family was human. And his family had committed treason. And his family was lost. And they would be like that little Daniel, left to die, if God did not send his son as a human being. Perfect God, perfect human. Does that make sense? This is not a myth. This is not a fable. This has an uncanny rationale and calculation to what God was doing because his family was on the line. And you love family so much, you will do what it takes to save your family.
For only as a human being could he die. And only dying could he break the power of the devil. Who had the power of death. Satan had a death lock on the human family. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. So the first truth is I'm adopted by God the creator. Second, I'm adopted by God my father. Third, I'm adopted because of my brother and your brother Jesus. Look at number four. I'm adopted with brothers and sisters. There are no only children in the kingdom. In Romans 5, 12 to 21, in 1 Corinthians 15, 23 and 43, the Bible tells us that there's only two families in the world. One family is under Adam, and the other family is under Jesus Christ. The family of Adam are sinners by nature and choice, and we're called in Ephesians 2, 2 and Ephesians 5, 6, we're children of disobedience. And we're children of God's wrath. I've talked to you about this before. God's wrath is not compulsive or impulsive. He doesn't get angry one day and love you the next. God's wrath is on every one of us who refuse to respond to what Jesus Christ dead on the cross. To reject Jesus is the most rebellious act I can do. He gives his life for me, and I reject him. The good news is that when you surrender your life to Christ, Father God adopts you, and you move from being a child of wrath to a loved child of God. Ephesians 2.19 says this, So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens, along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. What's interesting in the biblical language is this calling of each other brothers and sisters in Christ. In Paul's time, it was actually illegal to call someone who was a close relative, such as a brother or sister, if one was not legally related. To do so was to risk consuming the inheritance rights that were only to be distributed to close family members upon someone's death. But as many of us have experienced, our relationships with our brothers and sisters in Jesus are often closer and more fulfilling and more rewarding than our own flesh and blood family. I can't tell you, in just the last few months, how many of you come up to me and said, you've been the father I've never had. You've been the brother that I've never had. You've been the pastor that I've never had like this before. I always walk away in tears. What a privilege it is to represent Christ. But the truth is, I'm not the only one that does that. Many of you have been fathers to the fatherless here. You've been mothers to the motherless. You've been an auntie. You've been an uncle. You've been a brother. You've been a sister that other, they had them, but they were unkind and unloving to them. I think we under, we discount too much what it means to be brothers and what it means to be sisters. That's one of the most beautiful appellations that there can be. Polly is my brother. Joe is my brother. Mike is my brother. Kati is my sister. Alma's my sister. Justine's my sister. And I think sometimes we just give too much lip service to that. But as many as have experienced our relationships with our brothers and sisters in Jesus are often closer, sometimes more fulfilling. I am adopted into a family filled with brothers and sisters. So look at number five. I'm adopted with an inheritance. As a legally adopted son of his adopted father, Daniel shares in all the joys and the blessings of being a part of his family. 
one of the many benefits he receives is a right to an eventual inheritance. I'll never forget, I've had the privilege to stand with Rick and Joanne when they adopted Jesse, their wonderful, beautiful daughter, and as, they, as uh, Jeff and Mindy adopted Rosie. And I remember I was sitting next to Jeff, and as they were talking about everything that now belongs to this little Rosie, we both just sat and sobbed. And it was so powerful when he says, you realize now, Mom and Dad, she receives your inheritance. Any pension, any retirement, any kind of inheritance, she has a full right to it. And he and I were just holding hands and just sobbing. That's the power of adoption. And the Bible has the audacity to say to each one of us, we have an inheritance that comes through Jesus Christ. We have eternal life because of him. We have spiritual gifts because of him. We have forgiveness because of him. That is our inheritance. Too many times we're acting as we're impoverished beggars because we care too much about this world. He says what you should really be concerned about is eternity, and you've got a full entrance when you surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1, 11 and 14, 18 and 5, 5 describes our inheritance, which is both spiritual and material. Listen to this about our inheritance in Revelation 21, 3 and 4. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. Notice what will happen. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or sorrow or crying or a pain. Why? Because all these things will be gone forever. When God's kingdom church is fully established here on earth, our inheritance will include a resurrected, glorified body, entrance to the kingdom, the new heavens and the new earth, and we will engage in a huge family reunion filled with worshipful feasting and celebrating at the table of our father. I'm excited to see my father and mother one day. I look forward to that. I yearn to that. I hope my grandmother and grandfather is in heaven. I don't know if they really accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior or not. But we're going to see family, and it's going to be unbelievable. And I want to close with this. I'm adopted with a new identity. We have seen in our study of the book of Ephesians that our identity has key aspects to it that divine who we are. Our new identity begins with what Jesus called being born again or born from above. Salvation is a supernatural relationship. You have a new Lord in Jesus Christ. Bible says you've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. You've been given a new heart, new thoughts, new passions, new desires, new values, new power, a new mind, a new freedom, and a new ethic. With our new identity, Paul says, there is now to be a change in how we think and how we act. Our values and ethics changed from when we were living out our old nature. In Paul's teaching on adoption, we as believers enjoy the blessings, and Paul says we're to walk in these responsibilities of adoption. This is another four, five, six-part series, and I probably won't ever get to it, but let me just tell you what Paul says, and I put it up on the uh, PowerPoint for you. First of all, in 1-2, as an adopted child, we're to imitate God. Second, we're to walk in love. Third, you're to walk in the light. Expose things of darkness. Four, discern what pleases God. Walk is wise. Make the best use of your time. Be filled with the Spirit. Sing in passionate worship. Give thanks. Did something happen? Oh, somebody said did something. Okay. One of those senior moments, I guess. Submit to one another. Here's what we're not to do. Don't engage in sexual immorality, impurity, or covetousness. 
Let me just say this. If you've been an adopted son or daughter of God, it's an oxymoron that I would be involved in sexual uh, relationships and acts with anyone else other than my wife. Adopted kids don't act that way because that's part of darkness. That's not part of light. Number two, don't participate in obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes. These are not for you. Five, four. Number three, don't participate with those who practice the above behaviors. Four, don't take part in works of darkness, but expose them. Five, he says, don't get drunk. That's not to be your way of life. You walk in the light. You do these other things. You become this. Your father is perfect. He's loving. He's gracious. He's merciful. He's patient. He's holy. He's helpful and generous. Paul's argument is the more, loved ones, that you and I get to know your heavenly father. How? Through the daily Bible reading, through prayer, through worship, through service, time and fellowship with your brothers and sisters, the more you will come to love and enjoy him. Your desires will change from sin to holiness, and you'll increasingly want to be more like your father. Scott, does it ever get really super easy? No, never. Never. Walking with Jesus Christ is not easy. But it's satisfying and it's fulfilling. And it will do you well for eternity. You'll love what he loves. You'll hate what he hates. As a Christian, Paul argues that our goal is not to merely experience a change in behavior by changing how we act and how we react. Our primary goal is to get to know, love, and trust God as our Father. The result will be we will become like those whom we love the most. As we grow in our love for the Father, the Holy Spirit helps us to become more like him. The result is that we will stop sinning and start worshiping, not so the Father will love us, but it's because he already does. When you understand that you've been adopted, you don't do things or don't do things out of fear. You do them out of love. When my wife says, Scott, would you please stop doing this? That annoys me. As much as I might disagree with her, I'm going to stop it. You don't believe me? Ask her. And I will always say this. Well, I don't agree with you. I don't think that's annoying, but that's your decision. That's your call. So if it's annoying to you, then I'm going to stop it. Right? When my dad asked me to do certain things, I would want to do them because I love him. I do certain things with you all because I love you, not because I fear you. If you're here today and you've not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, know that he loves you deeply. That's why he gave his life for you. And he doesn't want you to feel alienated from him, cut off from him, abandoned from him. He gave his life for you. I want to strongly encourage you. Today is the day to step over the line of faith and say, Jesus Christ, I surrender my life into your hands. I don't understand everything, but I'm never going to understand everything. But what I do understand is, is that you gave your life for me, and I want to surrender to you today. It's the most eternal decision you can ever make. Let's pray.